Lillian Gantzudis. We are at the Atlanta History Center. It is August the 12th, 2004. We are interviewing Robert Gibson. Mr. Gibson, would you give me your name, birth date, and birthplace? My name is Robert Gordon Gibson. My birth date was August the 24th, 1918. I was born in Houston, Texas, where my father was in the Army in World War I, but then spent, grew up in northern Indiana. All right, and um, let's talk about your military service. Um, what branch of the service were you in? I was in the Navy. And did you, were you drafted or did you enlist? I was in, a graduate of the Naval Academy. So Tell us about your experience at the Naval Academy then. Well, uh, I when, went in, when, did, were you, when were you enrolled? I went into the Naval Academy in 1938. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was, became an accelerated class because there was a you know, threat of war. Normally it's a four-year class that graduate, would have graduated in June of 1942. Uh, it, it was accelerated and we were to graduate in December 1941. So happened it was the 19th of September, I mean of December. Uh, and But my Naval Academy experiences, it was a, a rigorous uh, academic and, and you know, a lot of military instruction. Uh, Fortunately, I had two years of college, or I don't think I'd have been able to make it, so I had a little bit of a head start. Where did you have the two years of college? In, at Purdue University in, mm -hmm. in Lafayette, West Lafayette, Indiana. Uh, but uh, the, we were sort of, it was a Sunday, of course, uh, in December. We were all kind of hanging around, and we didn't have radios. And we all were in different places, and I was sitting listening to a football game. And then they broke in and said there's been an attack by the Japanese. And this was on, you know, seven days, or, I mean, 12 days before we were graduates. And we had already reached, had our assignments made as to the ships we were going to, and I was being sent to a destroyer that was in the Java Sea. Unfortunately, it was sunk uh, during the early part of the war. And we, after graduation, we were sent to San Francisco, for those of us whose ships had disappeared, and waited until we were reassigned. So I was assigned to a ship that, that was in the uh, Maryland Naval Shipyard, which is outside of San Francisco. What was San Francisco like when you arrived and why you were there? Uh, you know, it was, uh, it, it was scared to death. We had blackouts, we had threat. We had news stories or radio that there's a submarine officer going to bombard us. And very nervous because we were there in early January, less than a month after the war started. Mm -hmm. uh, but San Francisco being San Francisco, it still had nightlife. And you were young? Did you well, enjoy the nightlife? Uh, no, we were all oh. waiting for something. Well, we, we did uh, have a drink or two, I must admit. Mm -hmm. But uh, we, were, we had to report every day until we got an assignment. Mm -hmm. And then we went off to our ships. And you said you were assigned to what ship? Well, I was assigned to the USS Preston, mm -hmm. which uh, was a older destroyer and built in the 30s. And uh, from there we went to Pearl Harbor. Now, during those days there weren't satellites, there weren't news stories, no one knew what happened at Pearl Harbor, uh, except people in the service, it was all secret, and we went in the harbor out there, and we knew nothing about what had happened, we knew there was an attack on it, and as we came in this, uh, with the entrance to the harbor, here was a battleship on its side, here was another one that rolled over, here was another sitting there on the bottom with oil still pouring out of it. And it was quite a shock. So when did you arrive in Pearl Harbor? Uh, it was about the end of January. So about 42. A month and a half yeah. after. And the, the, the word of what really happened didn't come out for several years. Mm -hmm. It was kept completely secret. Mm -hmm. Because they didn't want the Japanese to know what a, what a blow they'd made. Because they could have, if they'd had the ability, could actually have landed on the way, but they didn't, because mm -hmm. they weren't sure what damage they had done. Um, what, what was your feeling when you saw 
Pearl Harbor? Well, we were shocked and uh, we, we were suddenly realized that we were in a we were in a dangerous place. <laughs> and it was the first realization of what war might be like. We then uh, we then ran some convoys. There were, there, there were some islands south of Hawaii which they were putting, of all things, short defense guns on, which the Army was going to do. These were tiny little islands called Christmas, and uh, we went down there, and the first real thing that we realized what was happening, and pe seeing people who were dying, uh, a, an aircraft, uh, a bomber, they were sending bombers into Australia, and they were flying across the Pacific. They weren't being shipped. And we had this one that got that had gotten got lost, had a very new green crew, and they, they were out in the ocean, and they didn't know where they were, they were run out of fuel, and they started circling us. And then they made a crash landing just ahead of us. And we picked up the, the crew, and there were a couple of people very badly injured, and there were two or three that were dead. And that was the first time we actually saw someone who had been hurt by a war. Uh, we stayed in Pearl Harbor and did for a while. We went to the Battle of Midway, except we were we didn't get there. The battle was over by the time we got there. Then the Japanese made a feint at the Aleutian Islands, and we went up to the Aleutian Islands, and uh, but we never never made contact, so we came back to Honolulu. Then we later, a little bit later, we were in, put into a task force which was going out to the Western Pacific. That was this was about the time that Guadalcanal, the Battle of Guadalcanal towards the end of the October of 1942. And we were escorts to the big ships in most of the actions. And we were with a carrier task force uh, in uh, north of, uh, of Numea, uh, New Caledonia and in that area, or New Guinea, actually north of New Guinea. And that was one of the big uh, air actions of the war. And uh, the we lost one carrier, which we were protecting, and uh, which we didn't protect, I guess. And then there was another one that was quite damaged, and there were two Japanese carriers that were sunk. Can you name the um, carrier that was damaged? I think it was the Hornet. Mm -hmm. uh, no, the Hornet was sunk. Mm -hmm. it, 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 we sank it because it was so badly damaged that we torpedoed it, but mm -hmm. those of us on the ships sent torpedoes over and sank it. Um, then we went down to Numea, where, where the Navy had its main base at that time, Numea, New Caledonia, which was a French uh, province, you know. And we formed up a task force. With the, the intelligence was that the, the uh, Japanese Navy was going to send a major task force of battleships down into Guadalcanal because the Japanese were in considerable trouble because they couldn't be reinforced, they couldn't get supplies. And they were sending all these merchant ships down with supplies and they were being sunk at great rate. So the Japanese sent these big, big ships down to help protect it. We were in a task force of two battleships and four destroyers. And we went out, uh, and very few of the ships at that time had radar. So you, you, we actually didn't have a radar on our ship that could be used for fire control. And you're on the Preston still. And on the Preston. And we were in line in front of these two battleships. And about 2.30 uh, in the morning, we made contact with this group, which was coming in from the north, and we were aiming sort of easterly and westerly. Mm -hmm. And the battleships kept had radars, and they kept telling us where they were and how close they were. And then they opened fire with their big 16-inch guns because they could reach out a lot farther than we could. But some of the Japanese peeled off and came around behind us and came up on our other side. And uh, we were hit by 8-inch shells from a, a Japanese heavy cruiser. And I think we probably were hit with a torpedo, but we, we still, we still didn't, I still don't know that. And of the four destroyers that were in front of, we were in line with the destroyers in front. And of the four destroyers, three of them were sunk. 
and we were, we were hit and rolled over and sank in less than a minute. So anybody below decks had no chance. They were about half the people on the ship were, were killed, drowned. Where the eight-inch shell went into the engine room, of course, everybody ended up was killed. And so we ended up in the water, and it was dark, and some a low moon. And while we're in the water, the battleships had enough sense to drop some life rafts. So we were able to get to them. We were all wearing life jackets, and so we would, and we had whistles, and we would whistle, and we would get our people. The thing that was kind of scary is that we knew that probably there were some Japanese also floating around out there. And, but fortunately, we never get, the two of us never got to uh, But the principal thing I remember is when we did get sunk, we were directly in front of these big battleships that were doing 30 knots, which is about 35 knots an hour. And I, I got in the water, I was, a, I was a gunner officer, and I was on the top of the ship and the director, and the ship rolled over. And basically, I just stepped out into the water. So I was in the water, and we were there, and I looked up, and here came the Empire State Building at me. The battleship was right on line with us. And I had a life jacket on, but I broke the world record for 100 yards with a life jacket because we had to get out of the road. And I, and I was caught up in the bow wave, and it pushed me away. But we were all scared to death because these ships were reputed with their big propellers. If you got too near them, they would pull you down. Mm -hmm. But we, we survived. But one of the men got hit, broke his back, and died later. And we had a number of people that were uh, injured. Uh, we carried morphine, so we kept feeding the morphine. And then the next day, about, uh, well, the next morning, uh, a U.S. Air Air Army bomber came over, and they had, you know, they had tail guns. And I still remember that they were, we were covered with oil. I mean, you, they couldn't have distinguished whether we were Japanese, Afro-Americans, or what we were. And here were these guys up there in this airplane who didn't know what was down there, whether it was Japanese or, and then the machines got trained on us. And we kept, we were okay. <laughs> uh, and so uh, then we were, a destroyer about three in the afternoon came out and picked us up. We got aboard, and as I said, the oil from a destroyer was this, what they call a heavy bunker. And it was real thick. It was almost like tar. And we were all covered with it. This, you know, inch or two of this stuff on us. We got aboard the, the destroyer, and they had a saltwater fire hose and diesel fuel. And they scrubbed us down with diesel fuel and then hosed us off with these fire hoses, cut our clothes off of us, and set us down below to wait. And here we were, bare ass, uh, and at about that time the Japanese came over, aircraft came over and attacked the destroyer. Now, when you're in the fight, you're not scared because you're, you're busy doing something. But when you're sitting down there hearing the guns train and the guns going off and you don't have any clothes on, it was not a good feeling. And you'd only been out of the water how long? A couple hours oh, before? One hour. And so, but fortunately there was no damage to the ship and then they took us into an island called Tulagi, which is north of Guadalcanal, where the U.S. Har had a harbor and a base. Let me ask you, um, the Preston, how many men would have been on board the Preston? About 350, enlisted and about 20 officers, 18 officers. And how many survived? Uh, about six officers and approximately half the men. Of the officers, though, I was just a brand new ensign, and uh, the captain was killed, or, or he disappeared. We never knew what happened to him. The executive officer was right over where the, the gun had the ship, the, the ship had been hit, and he was killed instantly. The number three man on the ship was the uh, a lieutenant uh, who was wounded badly. The next guy in line was wounded badly. He was J.G. And there was another uh, ensign, a little senior to me, but he he went into shock. and So I ended up as a senior surviving officer and had to make these reports, deal with the admirals who 
were trying to get ideas on what happened. And uh, then I was on the island of Tulagi, I was also in charge of getting everybody organized and back to the United States, uh, sending them back into Numea either by ship or airplane, and getting them back to San Francisco. So I stayed on Tulagi a couple of weeks, and then I hitched like a ride on a <coughs> old DC-3 that barely made it back to New Mill and uh, came back on a transport that came back to the United States. And Betty was in, in San Francisco. We've been married uh, uh, on May the 15th. And so it was there in San Francisco when I got there. No, you were coming out, that's right. You, you were on your way. No, you came, you, were, you were actually in San Francisco at that time. So you were married before you went to Pearl Harbor? Yeah, or? yeah. Okay. May 15th. Yeah, and we were married on the 15th, and I sailed on the 17th, and I hadn't seen her since. <clears throat> uh, so that that's sort of the one big story of what happened to me. Mm -hmm. was, well, um, let me ask you, you get back to um, San Francisco, um, your wife is there. How long are you in San Francisco? Uh, we were there for oh, a couple of weeks, I guess, and then I was sent to a ship back in Boston that was being built under construction. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, in those days, there weren't any airplanes to speak of, so we took the train. I got 30 days leave, mm -hmm. and we took a train across country and stopped at her parents and my parents, and then went on to Boston, mm -hmm. which is a long story all by itself, because we, this was when racing was going on, and we didn't have any tickets, so we, I don't know what we ate, but it was macaroni. macaroni. <laughs> uh, and then the... Well, was everybody that was traveling, were they all in the same... No, no, we, uh, we scattered. But, oh. And when we got to San Francisco, they were all sent to other stations, other ships. Some guys went directly to ships that were going back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them went to new construction because now we were veterans. Uh, and they wanted... A lot of young, newer people were coming in that had no combat experience. And all of a sudden, we were combat scarred veterans. Mm -hmm. um, did your rank change? Did my what? Your rank. You said you were an ensign? Uh, yeah, I became a late a junior grade shortly thereafter, and a few months later, I was a lieutenant. I mean, they, they, Are you a lieutenant by the time you get to Boston? Uh, I think it was shortly after that. Mm -hmm. Then I was sent back. Uh, one, the executive officer of the ship that was sunk had left the ship and had gone to new construction, and he heard that I was. Uh, the ship had been sunk and that I was a survivor. So he put in a request that I be assigned to his ship, which would be built in S Seattle. So all of a sudden, I was, we were in Boston for six weeks or so, and I was sent back, we were sent back to, to Seattle. And is that another train ride without ration cards? No, that was a plane <laughs> ride. Oh. Where, where the, the military men on orders had priority. So they had this, wives and so forth had no priority. So every and this is the time when you flew from you know Baltimore to Pittsburgh to Chicago and you hopped across country. Mm -hmm. And every time we stopped they took Betty off because she had no priority. And then she'd have to wait to see whether there was a seat. And finally she got thrown off for good in Omaha. And uh, I went off. And she fought her way across country. And if you want to get a veteran story, I'd hear this one sometime. <laughs> she, she jumped, she got on a, uh, a little plane that was flying up to Denver with lost bombers in the snowstorm, but eventually got to Portland and took a train up to Seattle. She got there only about 24 hours after I did. I'd and say that's quite an pretty resourceful. Yeah, that's horrible. Yeah. Then uh, this ship was scheduled for the East Coast, so uh, we did training on the West Coast and went through the canal and then ended up uh, running convoys, big merchant ship convoys across the Atlantic for oh, about a year. Uh, and this was, by this time, the submarine threat had, a, had abated. And there were still submarines out there, but the German, the back of the submarine force had pretty much been broken. We did get a few scares and did some drops and depth charges. And one of the ships we were with was torpedo, but it, they weren't a real threat. The only threat was the weather. The North Atlantic in winter is a very, very difficult place. And is this the winter of 43? This is the winter of 43. Okay. Uh, and we would get into these huge storms, and a destroyer rolls up. 
and they had a thing called an inclinometer, which tells you how much you roll. There was a red mark on it. When you hit that mark, the chances were you were going to roll over. And I was on the bridge one night, and we rolled within one degree of that. So that that was another exciting event. Um, tell me the name of this story you're, you're on. Oh, this was the Frankfurt. Frankfurt. And of course, known as the hot dog. Uh, we, after a number of trips back and forth, we were assigned, we were sent to Europe, southern England, to be a part of the invasion force. Uh, we trained, uh, you know, dummy uh, on the invasion on the southern coast of England, on the beaches there. Uh, so it was training exercise getting ready. This Tell was, me about the training exercises. What well, were those were actually like? dry runs of, of going into a beach under, well, actually weren't under fire, but they did dummy fire, you know, the dummies, uh, blank fire. Mm -hmm. uh, but they'd send them in on um, pretty rough seas so that they get used to the idea. And there was one training exercise that was a disaster, which a number of people died. I think it was a couple, three hundred. Uh, the storm was so bad, it did what happened in Normandy. A lot of them capsized. And then they, we worked with the Army. because We were supposed to have spotters who went ashore and who would direct our gunfire. The destroyers all had five-inch guns, which were pretty good, you know, something like an Army 155 millimeter or close to it. And we, we were briefings and briefings and briefings. And, uh, we had the operation order had been worked been worked on for years, and it was this thick for us. And if you piled it all up, it was for all the units. That we, so you say when you say this thick, you're saying about 12 inches high. It was 12 to 15 inches high, plus a lot of annexes, which were not part of the main, but but it was a, a plan for the invasion in great detail, and the follow up. You know, how do you keep it logistically supported? And uh, one of the things that they gave us were the beautiful maps showing as if you were in the water looking at the shoreline in color and just beautifully done and in secret. And the National Geographic did a story on it about a year or so ago. And they, they reproduced the maps. And if you needed to back up and find that article, because it's a wonderful article about the cartography and the intelligence and how they were done. And I had one of those, I kept one, and my daughter now has it on her wall up in uh, near San Francisco. Mm -hmm. uh, but we actually made a false, uh, we, we started out for the invasion, actually before the invasion was made. Because we started out and we're halfway across the channel, uh, escorting uh, some ships. And we got this urgent message turn around, come back. So there was a dry, there was an actual start to the invasion a couple days before, that, before it actually took off. Because we we left Plymouth, or Port, Portland, I guess it was, along the south coast of England, uh, just at, at uh, sunset. So we went all A couple all of days night, before. The, the day before, the night before. And so we went all night at pretty slow speeds because we had slow things with it and got into the, the area off Omaha Beach about 3 in the morning. And then at that time the paraglide and the aircraft that were carrying the gliders, the paratroopers were going overhead. And uh, so but we were to open fire, I think HR was 6 o'clock, I, I kind of forgot. Mm -hmm. but it was it was still just daylight. What was the mood on the destroyer? Well, scared to death. Uh, I mean, we were all very tense, and uh, because we had no idea how strong the Germans were, and we were uh, much concerned about the aircraft. That this German still had a pretty good air force, but it was quite surprising they they weren't effective. They did not make too many attacks. And after the first couple of days, they didn't show up at all. And uh, which is one of the things I've never understood. Mm -hmm. Where were you stationed on the destroyer I was the that morning? I was the navigator. I was on the bridge. And that's where this came in, the, the, the map I had up here came into play. 
I had put the, I had a table, which was a navigator's table, where I did calculations, and I, I had the navigational maps. Am I running out of time? Mm -hmm. Okay. They're, they're detailed navigational maps, but this was an area map. It's not used for navigation. It was just to, and if you want to put your, I'll just quickly go through what's on the chart. Okay. Uh, the reason for the dark area is that I had it folded. And this was on my that table up in the bridge for almost 30 days. And this was the reason it's so dirty. The, the coast, the Omaha Beach was in here. The Utah Beach was over there towards the left. And up to the left is the Cherbourg Peninsula. The Germans, of course, had this heavily fortified, as they did along here. Uh, then the British were in, to the right over here. These were the American beaches, and the British were over in this direction, Juneau and Gold. Uh, this was the, the plot which we had stationed, and there, there were little buoys planted the night we were coming in ahead of us. The guys came in early and dropped, dropped these buoys. And then these were the lanes where we came in, because this was all heavily mined. The minesweepers came in first, about ahead of us. Uh, and frogmen had come in, were trying to blow up or cut the, the underwater obstacles that the Germans, the, okay, the T-bars that you see, you know, the great big thing. But uh, the destroyers formed a screen along this outer line and down the left. Well, we were the screen commander, and we were up in that upper left-hand corner as you face it. So we're looking at a grid, and the grid, the far left-hand corner, is where your we, destroyer we is. Were, we were stationed there because we were the screen commander, and there were destroyers all along this line. Mm -hmm. And you see, we were pretty far from the beach. We, mm -hmm. we could see it, but uh, we were pretty far out there. And down the left side, that diagonal line, were torpedo boats, because uh, that water in there is pretty shallow in that area. So uh, when daylight broke and there was a tremendous you know, shore bombardment, the battleships came in, uh, the, the destroyers fired, cruisers, uh, but we still were out here pretty far. The landing started at, at around 6 o'clock, and here the landing craft had, you know, there were transports, big ships had to come in here and anchor and, and dropped off the uh, landing craft. When you say big transports were out here, how far from shore? Oh, a quarter of a mile, uh, uh, half a mile maybe. So the big transports are half a mile out. Yeah, they're in. in As a destroyer, you're a little further out. We, we actually were a little further out. Okay. Uh, but we were, we were to move in for our shore bombardment. We left. Her. See, we didn't get to that point. We came down one of these channels, and to give in to do some shore bombardment first, and then we were sent back to take set up the screen after the invasion of the landing started. Okay. Uh, but we, our fire control party, uh, the, the army that was supposed to communicate with us and tell us what to shoot at, uh, was killed or their equipment was torn out. We never did hear from them. So we couldn't do anything. We couldn't see anything. And uh, so the captain of the ship, who was 29 years old, said, I, got, I have to do something. And we had the, 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 the Commodore, as it was called, and we were under his command, and we, the captain didn't ask him. He said, Commodore, i got to go in. And he said, okay. Do you so, remember the captain's name? Yeah, Jamie Sims. Who was the Commodore? Uh, well, I can't remember his name. That's okay. Go on. Uh, Jamie Sims was from an old Navy family. Uh, anyway, uh, and, you know, most of us, I was 26, I guess, 25. And so we could, we could pretty well tell that from the radio traffic that something terrible was happening over here. We couldn't see too much. So as we came in, we came in over here, we left the area and came in over here. And what beach is that? This Omaha? is Omaha. We, all of our activity was on Omaha. Okay. Utah was, a, was not a cakewalk, but it was not difficult. Okay. The Germans just didn't defend against it. 
So they had taken their beach by the end of the day. It was all over. But this, uh, they couldn't get off. These are bluffs that come up here, fairly steep bluffs. And these men were pinned down right along here. And the Germans had uh, batteries, of 105 primarily, that were down the beach. And they were just killing people, you know, anytime they pop up. Or they shoot the ships, I mean the landing craft. They'd sink them before they got there. And these kids were wearing so much gear, they drowned. They couldn't get ashore. So we got in here, and we now then had gotten to the point where we could see what was happening. And the, the destroyer has a rangefinder, which is a quite powerful optical system. And they could pick up this gun, or these guns. And so we started, we moved in, and the captain said, I gotta really get in there. And he, I was the navigator, so I was the one responsible for telling him whether he had enough water under it. And I kept saying, Captain, you got three feet left. Captain, you got two feet left. And he said, well, we're gonna go, we're gonna do it if we have to go around. And, but at that point, we turned and started firing. And we got down here, and then we backed up. And our fire control equipment couldn't figure out what the, we were doing. They under, you know, they understood ships going this way, but they didn't understand ships going backwards. But we got up here, and we could see this gun, and we opened fire on it, and we got an extremely fortunate hit right through the slip and hit the gun, and it uh, it, it blew it up. And that. that now, other guns were firing, and another destroyer did some what, what part of our group also came in with us, and they hit, hit another gun. And, but these, these people were actually lying down in the surf, and the tide was coming in. And the tide here is about 10 feet. So it, the beach basically disappeared. Uh, and, but they managed, we, we did enough damage to the guns that they start, finally started moving up the slopes. And uh, the, the, there's an article that was in Navy Proceedings, was written by one of the men on the beach, uh, who remembered the number on our destroyer. And uh, he wrote a story about the the, uh, the destroyer that saved the day. I have a copy of it here. It's in Naval Proceedings in 1998. What's the number? Huh? Do you remember the number on the destroyer uh, that he saw? Yeah, is that a car? So 297. 297. And uh, so then you, we could finally see them starting up the, the slope. But of course, there would be still people being killed. But they were managed to get up there, and, they had, and some of them got to the top that afternoon. And the next day, they started moving out. And of course, that's a story that Sam, Sam what is it? Ambrose has written in detail. Which is, and he actually talks about our activity in his books. Mm -hmm. So we sat and we worked. Uh, we had torpedo. Germans sent torpedo boats down from Cherbourg, uh, and we had a couple of scuffles with them, but nothing. I mean, we, we either scared them or I think we sank one. And uh, then one night, the Germans had a. a, a embryonic infrared system on their guns so they could tell when they, the heat, at least if they, were, they could get a bearing of where heat sources were like and the ship throws up a lot of heat. So we were set up to go in towards Cherbourg, towards the peninsula up there until we got shot at so we could spot the guns. <laughs> so we were decoys. Uh, fortunately I think they're all asleep because we kept going in and going in and nothing happened. But that didn't make it any less tense. Um, so, how long are you uh, in the channel here? About uh, 50 days. Mm -hmm. And we went back briefly uh, to Plymouth to, re to refuel, re get new ammo, and came back out and were there for another couple of weeks. Um, when you're there, what if you're just patrolling the channel? What's what are you doing day in and day out? Being pretty bored. Uh, you know, keep doing exercise and training, and uh, uh, you know we stood watch. We all we had eight hours of watch a day, and then we had to do our regular work. You know, the paperwork. If you're an officer, you did all that kind of stuff. And you did some paperwork. I mean, you had um, oh, yeah. a report on this. Is no, that correct? Not, not not on this activity. Oh, I'm sorry. Not on Omaha. That was written by the captain 
I wrote some notes as, as exec I was executive officer by that time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, but I don't have that. I, what are the handwritten notes that you gave us a copy of? Are, is, are, is for the activity in, in southern France when we moved into the, for the invasion down there. Okay. So okay, we were there, they went to England for a little while, and then they sent us through, through Gibraltar. And the uh, invasion of southern Pr Pr France had been planned as a secondary movement uh, after this invasion, mm -hmm. so that they could come in from both directions. And we were there on that invasion, and it, uh, the Germans by this time had pretty much left. There, was, uh, there were some, but the, the, that invasion, very few people killed, little damage. What's the date of this invasion? Uh, it was in uh, August, I think. I don't even remember. Okay. It would have been August uh, of '44. Well, it was. Yeah, I, my handwritten notes. Uh, yeah, it was in August of '44. I wrote this. I forget. I don't have a date. But it was in the towards the end of '84. Or 44. Okay. But we had, the, the main activity we had down there is the Germans had some e-boats based in La Spezia up in the, uh, on the Italian coast. And they sent them out hoping to torpedo some of the ships that were on the, in the invasion force. And they didn't know we had radar. So we saw them a long time before they had any idea where we were. And uh, we opened fire on them and they never got a chance that they were going to come out with torpedo. But they never really had a chance, and we hit it. And they abandoned ship. And so I was sent over as the head of the boarding party, since I was the number two person on the ship. And uh, we got over there, and we went aboard, and they had opened the seacocks. They, you know, they were trying to let sink it. And there was water coming into it. And uh, across the, the line, there was a line that led across the stern. And I, it looked like it had tangled on something, and, and so I cut it. And it was a booby trap. They had tried to, they were, when they got in the water, they were going to pull this line and set off the booby trap, which would blow up the boat. And unfortunately, I didn't pick it up and pull it. Uh, so we got, we got back, we took it in tow. But it, uh, it got so much water in it, it finally just broke the line and sank. Um, how many Germans on the boat did we you had about, I think there were about 15 or 16. I, there, there, there's a little story in my other book that I have here mm -hmm. called the, the Hot Dog Goes to War. Uh, and they were, most of them were real young. The, and the skipper was a dedicated Nazi. He, he, was, he demanded that he eat with us in the war room in the ostrich country. He wasn't a prisoner of war. He was, he was a Nazi commanding officer. And uh, so he ate in the war room, the war room with us. Uh, we did pump them and got quite a bit of information out of them. Uh, one of them was so disgusted with the war, he took his Nazi helmet and cut it in two. <laughs> so, uh, but that, you know, that was pretty much the end of my activities in, in a combat situation because we came back to the United States not too long after that mm -hmm. and the war was approaching the end and uh, by that time I was due to be transferred and so that was the end of my seagoing days. I was sent to Annapolis and, and was an instructor there for a while mm -hmm. and uh, then went off to graduate school in the Navy. Um, let's um, take just a minute, and I'm going to move the camera, okay. and I'm going to get your wife to tell us about her experiences, her traveling experiences. All right. On my way to Seattle. On your way to Seattle. Well, um, or even, um, uh, what was San Francisco like when your husband was overseas, then traveling well, back and seeing your parents. Tell me about getting married. Just something about what your well, experience married, was. We had wanted to get married and things were in such a flux. So finally he came back and we decided we'd better get married if we were going to get married. 
So we were married at the uh, cathedral in San Benito, Knob Hill, San Francisco. The Grace Cathedral. Grace Cathedral. And he left two days later. Mm -hmm. And uh, Was your family there? or My mother was on her way, but she didn't make it. <laughs> but we couldn't. We had no choice. It was either then or, you know, who knows when. And we had been engaged for two years, so we were anxious. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the trip from Boston to Seattle was unbelievable, because when I, they took me off in Omaha, we, when we packed from Boston, we only could take two pieces of luggage, and I was going to be in three different climates, winter, spring, and summer. So we put all my clothes in these two bags that would carry me through. And Bob had the traveler's checks in his name. I had about $5 in my purse. So he goes off in Omaha. I have $5 and only one bag of luggage, which didn't have any underwear in it. <laughs> anyway, so they said if, if I could get on this little commuter plane that came from Cheyenne, and it would come as soon as they found the 12 Army bombers that were lost in the snowstorm. Now, this was January, I believe, something in the winter. Uh, I could get, if I got to Cheyenne, the plane from Chicago will have missed a lot of passengers and there would be a seat. So the, one of the United designers of some sort of business in the United Airlines was trying to get there also. So finally the plane arrived and we'd get on this little bitty thing. And of course I'm too young to know that it was the, probably the most dangerous thing in the whole world. We get on this plane, we take off, the door flies open, the pilot comes back, reaches out, closes the door. Then he says, you want an orange? <laughs> anyway, we land and then the car meets us, the United Airlines uh, car meets us and takes us to a hotel which is in Cheyenne, and I had never seen a hotel that had one single door on the street with stairways going straight up. And I thought, oh my goodness, what am I getting into? Well, it was a lovely hotel. And they said they'd call me when the plane was going to, from Chicago was going to arrive. They didn't know when. Well, I had one pair of stockings, so I rinsed them out. And they called me about 3 o'clock in the morning saying the plane is going to be here in about an hour. Well, my stockings are soaking wet. It's freezing cold outside, so I put them on the light, the lamp, to dry, and of course they burned. <laughs> I had no stocking. So anyway, we get to Cheyenne, or we leave Cheyenne, and we go to a fuel stop in the southern part of Idaho, I believe it was, which was desert. There is nothing anywhere that you could see for miles around. It was flat. And it was a Quonset, large Quonset hut that had the fuel. And they took, told me I had to get off, that I couldn't go any further. And there wasn't even a railroad within sight. There was nothing. And I stood there and cried just like a baby. And the pilot felt so sorry for me that they literally took a garbage can full of gas out and let me get on. And that's how I got to And then were you in Portland? Did you stay in Portland? No, I oh. just, I got, they said that there was a mail plane I probably could get on going to Seattle. I said, no thanks, I have enough money to buy a, a coach ticket to from Portland to Seattle. I was going to go that way. So um, while Robert is in Seattle, you all are together. When he leaves and heads to Europe, do you stay in Seattle? No, no, uh, they were going to, uh, we stayed with uh, another couple in Seattle because housing was very scarce and uh, she had a car and the ship was going to go from Seattle to San Diego. So we drove to San Diego and met them there mm -hmm. and then I think I went home. Yeah, yeah. I, I went back to St. Louis and stayed with my mother while he was on his way to Europe. Mm -hmm. Yes, that was right because my mother who had no inkling of what the war was about, absolutely none, came woke me one morning and said, oh, they've invaded Europe and not a shot was fired. <laughs> oh, oh. 
<laughs> that's my experience. <laughs> so that was your experience with D-Day. Not yes. a shot was fired. That's right. When did you find out that yes, a shot was fired? Oh, right away. I mean, oh. in radio. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yes. 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 And um, did you all correspond? I mean, were there letters back and forth, oh. or? Yes, rarely, but mm -hmm. they they came. And mm -hmm. uh, yes, yeah. Then I went on to New York because that was the place. Uh, and got an apartment there. Mm -hmm. and so were you in New York when um, Robert comes back? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you were there to meet him. Yeah. How exciting was that? Yeah, she was oh. really there to meet him. Yes. <laughs> you were in the hospital. Oh yes. When he came back, I was delivering our first child. <laughs> I yes, our first. I forgot. Yes, our Diane was. Uh, was on her way. Just a minute. I'm going to have to turn over. We are restarting the videotape. Thank you. And you're in the hospital. Yes. Diane had started to arrive, so I called a taxi and went to the hospital. And uh, What day is this? October 3rd, 1944. Mm -hmm. And um, in the middle of my labor, Bob arrives. Did you know that he was arriving that I, day? Yes. Well, I, no, not really. Uh -huh. uh, uh, communications on ships was very, very secret. Mm -hmm. And um, you never talked about where your husband was, even if you knew, which, but you don't, nobody knew really. Mm -hmm. uh, it was terribly secret. Um, so, um, Mr. Gibson, when you get off of the boat, do you know? that your wife is in the hospital. How do you know to get to the hospital? You know, that's a good question. I, I think you must have, there must have been some way that you t told me that, uh, of course I knew that you were pregnant, but uh -huh. some, it may have been someone at the apartment. It could have been one of Because I went to the apartment, it could have been somebody there that told me that she was mm -hmm. getting over at the Brooklyn Naval Yard. I, um, so she, so you're at the Brooklyn Naval Yard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what is delivery like at this, what's going on in the hospital while you're delivering? Well, they had obstetricians. I mean, it was a family mm -hmm. care hospital. The Navy's very, very good with their hospital care for dependents. Mm -hmm. Extremely good. And um, and is there anyone with you? I mean, has your family come? Is oh, there... no. You travel during the war. It was n n near impossible. I so, mean, you, you just didn't do it. I mean, So are you no alone? Way. Yes. But I'm, I mean, and doing what you're supposed to do, delivering I'm, a baby. Was very when you're when you're living alone in the world and you're single or mm -hmm. married but single, you become very independent and you're very much in charge. And I was very much. The only thing that sort of was funny is a taxi driver dropped me at the hospital and I paid him, and I had. I'll say the fare was fifteen dollars. Well, I gave him twenty, and I stood there and waited for my change. And he said, "You're not in a big hurry, are you?" <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but, oh, that's you know, it, Everything was just, you know, as far as I was concerned. You have to remember, I was very young and and not experienced in this sort of thing. So I wasn't. I mean, I was not. You know, I. Just took it in my stride. Whatever came, came. Um, so tell me. Uh, so you, were you still in labor when your husband walks into the oh, hospital? Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh -huh. Yes. It was. That must it, have been an amazing sight. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was not too. I mean, he was not prepared for this large woman sitting <laughs> lying in bed screaming her head off. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't the lady I left. Oh <laughs> uh, well, um, tell us about your other um, children. Is this you said this was your first oh, daughter? Yeah, this, yes. Well, we had we have four, uh, but the others were. Uh, well, tell me their names and when they were born. Oh well, then Barbara was born two years later, and then Robert was born about ten years later, and Nancy, my last dance wife was born two years after that. Fifty-five. Fifty-five. It was, uh, mm -hmm. and, but, uh, and they, they're scattered. Yeah, mm -hmm. yes. 
All right, um, is there anything else that you would like to contribute about civilian life, civilian life the, the, or military life, the wife of a naval man during the war? Well, in San Francisco it was kind of interesting, I thought it was unusual, is all the wives of this particular task force, which were the battleships, the cruisers, the destroyers, and so forth, um, all lived in San Francisco, and there were about 30 of us that lived in this one apartment building. And since our husbands were gone, and we were all about the same age, in our very early 20s, late teens, uh, had dinner together every night. And we all had these one bedroom or no bedroom apartments. And we would cram 30 people into this little living room, and there would be like two of them would take charge of dinner and they were in charge of buying dinner, which meant 12 cans of beans or whatever they decided to serve, or tuna fish salad, and they would have the grocery checks, and it would, might add up to maybe $8.45. Well, they'd divide it by 30, and then everybody would put in their 12 cents worth or whatever it was dinner cost. And we did that every single night because most of us had jobs or did something during the day, and then we get together at night. And uh, but when he did come back from, uh, I guess it, it was one of your trips in the Pacific. When I came, when I came back from uh, being sunk. No, this is when the uh, destroyers came in under the. Bridge. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Uh, one time they came back, and we had no idea where they were. You know. And we were in one of my friends who had in another apartment elsewhere up on the top of the hill that overlooked the bay. And we were up there playing poker, doing something. And um, one of them looked out and said, oh, there are destroyers coming in. And I didn't think anything of it, you know. So there are thousands of destroyers to me. But. So then we went down to the pancake place to have his dinner. And somebody came running in and said, your husband's home. Well, you never saw anybody fly faster than your life. I ran out in the middle street. There was a cab stopped with somebody in it. I hopped in it, and I said, sorry, we're going to such and such a place. It was, what, where five, do we live on? 565 here. 565 here. We're going there. And the man was so nice, he let me go. I mean, they took me home. And, but uh, anyway, I just dropped everything and ran. Oh, that's a wonderful This was, This was before we went out to the far west. We, we you, were, you were convoying, I think. Yeah, we were. We had come back to San Francisco a, week, a couple months after we were married. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this was the first time yeah. we came back after that. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to um, turn the camera back. We've okay. got um, about five or six minutes. And I just wanted to ask if there was um, um, uh, medals. Um, did you, um, I see that you have two bronze stars, Purple Heart. Where did you get the bronze stars and Purple Heart? Well, the Purple Heart was, I did get banged up when I left the ship when I was sunk. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, it was not enemy, it was not directly enemy action, but I got trapped under the gun, I mean under the director, and pretty scraped up my leg pretty much. You know, it wasn't direct, mm -hmm. but that's, they gave Purple Hearts for that. Mm -hmm. And then the Bronze Star. The Bronze Star, one, uh, was for the, the event with the torpedo boats when I went with one because, they, mm -hmm. you know, I had not done anything too dumb. Uh, the other one was uh, actually for being in the, the invasion of Normandy. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they, they sort of, you know, there's a hierarchy of metals, and so what they do is they, in the command structure, they give Legion of Merit to the top commander and the captains of the boats or the ships would get uh, something like a Silver Star and then I was at the, I was at the Bronze Star level. <laughs> uh, we had to have done something but uh, it, it was, uh, so those were the two. The, that was sort of a routine thing, the, the one with the Evo was, uh, it was somewhat unique. Mm -hmm. um, when you were um engaged in battle D-Day um, or at any other point, did you realize how big this event was, how historic it was? Did you have any perception 
of how this would change the world? Uh, the, the invasion, definitely, yes, because Eisenhower uh, had sent out essentially that says you're going to be getting involved in one of the biggest things in the, in the history. Mm -hmm. And don't follow it up, sort of. Uh, but uh, the the one in the Pacific, we were at that time you know, we were struggling to not get overrun by the Japanese, and we had been pretty badly, and we we're struggling back. So I don't think we saw much there, which said, "Hey, this was a big event." And actually, it didn't. It turned out in history books, it's sort of a little paragraph. D-Day is written about forever. Mm -hmm. So it was pretty obvious to us that we were in something that was quite historic. When you pulled into Pearl Harbor for the first time, did you know that that was historic? Well, we knew enough about Pearl Harbor that, that, that we knew there was damage. Mm -hmm. uh, the Navy had sent out some things that said, but they didn't give you any particulars. They just said that there were, and they, you know, the two, there were two destroyers in Dry Dock that got hit and blew up. Now, it's pretty hard to hide that. And uh, so there were things about what we'd lost and, and how many had been killed. So it, it was just the, the size of the damage or the breadth of it that uh, was shocking to us. Mm -hmm. And you can say, hey, the battleship got sunk, but that doesn't mean anything to you unless you go in there and see this thing all beat up and oil pouring out of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is there anything that you want to add, any part of the story that we, you haven't told? Well, probably about two hours worth, but uh, which I'll think of after we leave. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think there's, you know, there is one thing I wanted to, to go through. Um, let me see if I can find it. The thing that I think was different about the war is everybody knew what we were doing. We knew what the objective was. It didn't make any difference whether it was the Admiral or the first kid, you know, enlisted out of Kentucky, first time he had shoes on. Uh, but we tended to form pretty cohesive teams. It was if you're on a ship or you're in the Army or in an Air Force, Army Air Force squadron. So you, because you knew you were going to be together for a while, and uh, it's so. But I have a little poem here that it was a young kid came aboard who was almost illiterate. Uh, came out of I believe the hills of Kentucky, and he uh, uh, was always getting in trouble it's because he wasn't he wasn't very smart, and. Uh, let me, I want to make sure I find it. Just to give me a minute to see what I'm going to do. For a brief pause, and if you want to read the poem. Yeah, the, the question of, of if I had something more to say, and I was pointing out that we knew the objective in World War II, and we tended to be in, in organizations that lasted for some time, and so we became a team. And a young man on the ship that I was on was almost illiterate, uh, from schools in Kentucky, and we had a reunion some 50 years later, and he brought this poem with him, which he'd written. He said, uh, uh, this is where I grew up, where I lived from 17 to 21. This was my high school, my teacher, and my peers. This was my home, my job, a new life of sorts. This was my library my theater, my ticket to worldly ports. She was both beautiful and deadly, and the only one of her kind. She was a sleek and fast little bit of molten Mother Earth. She carried me across the ocean to a world beyond my dreams, and, <coughs> excuse me, and to a store of memories to cherish as long as our seas. Oh, that makes me cry. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. He became a very successful player. What's his name? I don't know. Do you know? I have mm -hmm. no idea. Um, Thank you very much. So, Is there anything else? Or? No. Well, I was just thinking... Uh, I have two minutes on the tape. Two minutes. 
Well, I thought maybe if, if you... I just wanted to quickly go into southern France. Do you, you want to stop it while I find this? It was... He was starting. It was some the morning of August the 18th, 1944. And they had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Fourteen, fourteen people were aboard. One officer, uh, Ernest Swinson, who was the captain, 22 years old. The rest of them were all younger than he, except for one mechanic named Wolfgang, who was 26. These were the, these were the people who were left in Germany to mm -hmm. fight the war. Thank you so much. Thank you.